Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunday morning here at Calvary Chapel Grants Pass. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, as everyone's making their way into their seats, do we have any first time visitors today? No, everybody, no first time visitors? Well, then welcome back, everybody. Oh, wait, I see some hands back there. We have a, a little welcoming gift for you that one of the elders or pastors will be bringing over for you. So, And with that being said, we have just a few announcements before we get on with the worship. For you men, there is a conference coming up, <coughs> oh, excuse me, in um, men's conference coming up, a one-day conference in Corvallis. Um, on March 11th, so we'll get a sign-up sheet out for that um, here really soon. So, so anyway, so 10 o'clock on Mondays, please be in prayer while the team goes out there. If you'd like to be involved with it, you can talk with Bernie. Um, I know they can always use cases of bottled water and at times tortillas. How are you guys doing on tortillas? Huh? So flour tortillas, if you'd like to donate, you can bring them here and we'll get them to him. Then speaking of food, we have the, um, yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> On January 28th, the uh, 55 and older um, luncheon. So if you'd like to come be a part of it, I can't guarantee the food's gonna look as good as this, but <laughs> there will be, it will be a luncheon. Food will be provided, um, but, like I said, I'm not guaranteeing it'll, it'll be as good as this one will be. All right, and then let's see what else we have. And then also, if I can get my thing to work here, um, on the 22nd, which would be a week from today after, at 1 p.m. is the March for Life. It begins at the Josephine County Courthouse on 6th and B. So if you would like to, after service, go uh, join in in prayer uh, at the courthouse. Uh, it'll meet at one o'clock. So we have that. And then coming up on February 18th, we have the men's breakfast coming up. So um, it, I can't guarantee it'll be as good as the 55 and over <laughs> luncheon, but um, like it says here, it'll, it'll feature real bacon at least. So yeah. not as good as SpaghettiOs and Vienna sausages, but you know, we do what we can. Um, and with that being said, let's go before the Lord in prayer as the worship team makes their way up here. Lord, we come before you, and God, we are so grateful that you allow us to gather together here. Lord, that we can uh, worship you in spirit and in truth. And so, Lord, I pray for your anointing upon the worship team now, Lord. And God, I pray that you would just give us hearts to uh, where we can just... Forget everything else, Lord, that we can limit the outside distractions and fully focus on you, Lord. So God, be with us now, and it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning again, and welcome. If you're tuning in online, welcome as well. Why don't we all stand this morning as we worship our Lord.
standing or take a seat however you feel most comfortable worshiping this morning. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see to see you open the eyes of my heart Lord open the eyes of my heart I want to see you I want to see you to see you high and lifted up shining in the light of your glory pour out your power and love we sing holy, 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 holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes. Holy, holy, holy 
I want to see you. Amen. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand. The moment I wake up till I lay my head, I will soon and the goodness of God. Sing to the Lord this morning. All my life you have been faithful. Oh, yeah. All my life you have been so, so Have led me through the fire, the darkest night. Your ghost was no other. I know you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. offering spot right in the service this morning. Amen. Take one for the worship team. Good morning. How's everyone doing today? Good. You know, this is the time in the service that is the most thrilling. Um, I was being serious, Becky. I'm thrilled. Here, here's, here's, here's the words from the Lord. It says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, 
says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough even to receive it. You know, this is one of the few times that we get to give the giver of all things something back that he has given us. And it's for the eternal kingdom. We get to be a part of building an eternal, everlasting kingdom. So isn't that, that's why it's thrilling. It is. It is really thrilling. It should be, you know, that is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is to be having the gift to give back to a kingdom that is everlasting, especially to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit that allows us to see that everlasting kingdom. Thank you for being regenerated that we are actually in the kingdom of heaven because of the king of righteousness. So, Lord, we ask that as these tithes and these offerings to the king of kings, just like those wise men who brought gifts, we get to bring our gifts and our tithes into your house to build an everlasting kingdom. So, Lord, bring forth the praise of the giver, and we give in faithfulness to your kingdom, Lord. We ask that you would just use these tithes for that purpose, to build your house. We thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated. The breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your side. So you made a way across the great divide left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside and there at the cross you paid the debt i owe broke my chains freed my soul for the first time i had thought Darkness into glory. 
stretch out our hands this morning. Lord, we lift up our children to you, Father. We place them in your hands. Lord, thank you just for children, God, and the blessing they are, Lord. And thank you that we are all your children, Father, Lord, and that you see us as dear children, as your word tells us. So, Lord, we lift up our, our little ones to you, and we pray for protection. We pray the word of God would dwell richly in their hearts this morning and in their minds, God. We love you so much. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. As we've kind of gone through, um, well, we've been in the book of 1 Corinthians for, well, since last January. So it's been a year that we've been going through the book of 1 Corinthians. And, and I don't know about you, but one of the things that have, has become real obvious over this last year of of going through 1 Corinthians is that the Corinthian church was kind of Paul's problem church. You know, it seems like he was constantly having to correct it for one thing or another. And so, you know, it's kind of interesting because in that church, it, it was kind of a melting pot, wasn't it? You know, the uh, Corinth was a seaport um, there. And so there was a lot of different nationalities and cultures that were represented there. And and throughout the church, you know, you've seen it kind of manifest itself and in, in in divisions and, and really bring it, bringing into the church some of the pagan practices, et cetera. And Paul has spent a lot of time, uh, you know, correcting all of those different things within the church. And so we've reached this point in chapter where we started chapter 12, and he starts talking about the gifts and what the gifts are. Uh, are and what they represent and how really each one of us has gifts. God's given us all gifts, right? Um, and those gifts are given um, as He wills. And also there's a variety of gifts. You know, we talked about how there's diversities in ministries and in the gifts, you know, where, and I use the example of, um, for instance, myself and Pastor Aaron, we both have the gift of teaching, but we do it in a, in a different way. We have a different style to it. Because if we all used our gifts in the same exact manner, or we all had the same gifts, it would be boring, wouldn't it? You know, if everybody was, if we, you become a Christian and then it just becomes this cookie cutter thing where everybody's exactly alike. You know, it'd be boring, but no, God's given us all different gifts as he wills. And, you know, ultimately, the one thing, though, is those gifts are given for what? So that we can bring glory to God, right? You know, because earlier in Corinthians, in 10, chapter 10, verse 31, it says all that we say and do, we do for the glory of God, or that we should be doing for the glory of God, right? And our spiritual gifts are no different than that. And so... Last week we, we left off in verse 27, and so this week we're going to back up to verse 25 and then go through the first three verses of, of chapter 13. Um, so as some of you know, uh, Linda and I are, are getting away for, uh, we'll be gone the next two Sundays, so Pastor Aaron will be teaching through 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and then... I'll come back and, and start up with 14. We'll still be in the gifts of the, of the Spirit. So, um, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, like I said, in verse 25 is where we'll begin. But before we do, let's begin with a word of prayer. 
Lord, we come before you, and God, we are so grateful that you allow us just to uh, set up Uh, your feet, Lord, that we can learn from you, God, that we can just glean wisdom from your word that you've given us. And so, God, I pray that you'd open our hearts and minds now as we look into your word. And Lord, as I always pray, I ask that you would give us courage to be doers of your word and not hearers only. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. So um, one of the places that we left off last week, or or Paul was using the analogy of the body, right? You know, saying that each and every part of the body is important, um, you know, as far as spiritual gifts go. And, uh, you know, he was saying not everyone could be an eyeball. That'd be kind of weird, right? You know, and if everybody was an eyeball, there would be no who would be there to hear. And if everybody was an ear, who would be there to see, et cetera, et cetera. And he went through this analogy. And it's true with our spiritual gifts too, isn't it? You know, each and every one of us are important. Each and every one of us has a purpose to serve within this church. And when we're not... um, when we're not living out, when we're not using those gifts God gives us, then the body of Christ suffers. We're not whole. We're not as healthy as we can be. And so in verse 25 through 27, it says that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ in members individually. Once again, you know, it's that thing where we're all important. Every one of you plays a vital part in the church here. Every one of you has a role and has a purpose. And every one of them is just as important as any other role here. Each and every one of us, you know, whatever that is that... Um, God's called us to do whatever those God-given gifts are. If we're using them, then the body is healthy, right? You know, some of them might be more um, uh, more public in the sense of someone like me up here teaching. But I guarantee, you know, that person that is praying for this service right now, and the one who is, you know, in their prayer closet, and and those more private gifts like that, or the gifts of giving, or just all of the different gifts that are are demonstrated in a service like this are as important as any of them, you know, because um, all of those gifts given together all play a vital part in what we uh, what we're doing here, and and so it's important just to remember remember that, and as we continue on through uh, the verses here, uh, we'll see that that each one of them have been appointed by God, right? And if they're God appointed, if he's appointed you to a certain gift, uh, if we're not using them, then not only is our own walk not healthy, but, you know, as a church body are not healthy. And so uh, as we get into these verses here, just think about that for a moment. You know, what has God willed for you to have as spiritual gifts? What has God willed for you? What is his will as far as your spiritual gifts goes, and are you practically using them to serve the church and to bring glory to God? You know, because each and every one of us has those gifts. We need to be sensitive to the Spirit. We need to be open to the Spirit, right? Um, Because it's important that we do. And those gifts that God's given us, He's equipped us with them. You know, He's given us power within them to uh, fulfill His purpose. It's a beautiful thing when we're using those gifts together, aren't we? And then as it continues on in verse 28 through 31, and it says, God has appointed these in the church first, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, gifts of helps, gift of administration, variety of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. And then as it continues on in the verses that we're going to be looking at, it says in chapter 13, which is really a continuation of what we're talking about, it says, though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. 
And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. So, you know, why is that? It's saying all of these gifts, you know, that he listed, uh, all of these gifts, if they're being used and they're not being used with love, then they're worthless. In fact, I would even go as far as to say they're, they are harmful to the body. You know, when you see someone who, for instance, has the gift of teaching or preaching and, and they use it for self-gain or, or for self-promotion or, or you see, you know, just, you know, that arrogance and, and almost self-entitlement because of it, it's harmful. You know, these gifts, um, when they're used properly, when they're used with love, that's when they have power, don't they? But when they're used for self-promotion, um, then it loses all the spirituality, doesn't it? You know, and that's what he, uh, he was addressing last week when we were talking about, <coughs> excuse me, the, the gifts. It was saying, you know what, um, you guys want these gifts. You want the gifts of tongues. You want all of these gifts so that you can show off, basically. And that's not the purpose of any of the gifts. All of them are to be used for the glory of God. That It's that simple. It's not about us gaining anything, is it? And if they're, you know, and if we truly are in the spirit and we're truly children of God, then that should easily flow from us. Why is that? Because, uh, you know, as it says in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, it says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So if everything that we do, if it's not done out of love, um, then we just look like the world, don't we? You know, if it's not done out of love, then there's no, no distinguishing characteristics between us and those on the outside. If, if it's not done in love, then why would anybody on the outside want to come in? There's nothing different. They can go out in the world to seek their own interest, right? They can stay outside of the walls to seek their own interest. But it's that moment, and it's powerful, when all that we do is for love for one another, right? When we show that love of Christ, when it not only uh, shines in us, but through us, and that love comes, you know, exudes out of us, it's powerful, isn't it? You know, it's infectious. It was like, wow, there is something different about that person. There is something different than the way I'm treated in the world. And I want to know more about it. I want to know what it is. Everything that we do, including, like I said, the exercise of the gifts that God's given us, needs to be done in love. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 11, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who, is, who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. You know, God said, you know, I want to make sure you understand this point. I want you to understand how important demonstrating love is. In fact, uh, I will model it myself. I will send my son to be a propitiation for your sins. You know, and that word really means, um, you know, turning away of anger. Here's the definition. Turning away of anger by the offering of a gift. Uh, you know, um, that's what propitiation means. You know, God offered his son up to give us the gift of salvation, didn't he? You know, he, that's how much it meant to him. That's how much love he demonstrated for us. You know, it wasn't something that he was just telling us to do. He modeled it for us, didn't he? You know, and it's that kind of love that should, like I said, that not only should be 
shining into us, but it should be shining through us. You know, that self-sacrificial kind of love, that kind of love where we're not trying to uh, build ourselves up or boast, but that we're esteeming others above ourselves. You know, that we're using everything that God's given us, uh, not only for his glory, but to build each other up. That's true love, isn't it? And so then as we, as a backdrop, we go back to the verses in uh, chapter 12, 25 through 27. It says that there should be no schism in the body, but the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the bodies of Christ and members individually. You know, once again, you know, it starts off with that there should be no schism in the body. A schism is a division or a separation in the body, right? And it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? You know, if you look at the Corinthians church, the Corinthian church, um, Paul rebuked them or taught them that all of the divisions that were going on there needed to stop, right? It wasn't the divisions weren't out of love, right? It was done out of, out of social status. It was done out of all of these different things. And God said, that's not love because God is not a respecter of persons, is he? You know, it doesn't matter to him if um, who you are, he loves you anyways, you know? So, so he's saying there cannot be, if we're demonstrating the love and using the spiritual gifts he was talking about, there should be no divisions in the church. There should be none of that. It can't exist in a God-loving, God-fearing um, believer or a body of believers, right? Because that's not God, is it? It's not in his character. It's not what he demonstrated for us when he sent his son to the cross to pay the penalties for our sin, right? You know, that was the ultimate uh, demonstration of love that there ever could be. You know, he's saying, you know, imitate me. Here's what I've done. This is the self-sacrificial agape love that I gave unto you by sending my son, you know, to pay the penalty for your sins. And then as he continues on, in verse 28, and it says, God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then the gifts of healings, helps, administrations, and variety of tongues. You know, Paul concludes this section um, of this discussion of the body with a second list here of spiritual gifts. And, you know, I love how first and foremost, um, Paul says, First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, and variety of tongues. I know for a lot of people, especially in the Corinthian church, they were more interested in those gifts that were public. You know, if, if it would have been most of the members in the Corinthian church, they would have probably went with the gifts of miracles first, then the gift of healings, those that were, were public, those that really brought glory to them. Them, right? But Paul says, no, this is the, the list here. And I also noticed that these gifts that are mentioned here vary and are different than the gifts that are mentioned in <laughs> Romans chapter 12. And, you know, thinking about why is that? Uh, why would Paul do that? And it's simple as this. You know, earlier last week we talked about diversity in gifts and in ministries, right? And, and once again, it's not a one size fits all. Each and every one of us, God has gifted us with individualized set of gifts, right? To use in the way that God's called us to use. So there is that variety. And God lists them in different spots or, you know, inspired the writers to list them in different spots for that reason. You know, it's not this person, you know, the moment that you become a Christian, this is what you'll get. No, they are God appointed, right? And we see that, and God has appointed these in the church. He's appointed these gifts to each and every one of us. He's gifted us with different gifts. You know, think about a, a Christmas time. If we gave everybody the same gift, right? You know, you've got grandma over here, and then you have your kids, and you have all these people, and you gave them all a baby's rattle, you know. What am I supposed to do with this, right? It's the same with, I know that was a horrible example, but I think you get the idea. I'll admit it. I don't mind admitting it. But, um, but you know what I'm saying there is like, 
um, you might get the gift of, of teaching and go, no, never. You know, you're not getting me up. Or if you don't have the gift of teaching, coming up here and going, now what? Right? You know, God gave me that gift, and I know he gave me that gift because if, he, um, if you don't know me and you were to meet me in public, you would probably, I'm the shyest person there is. I have a hard time with one-on-one -on -one conversations with anybody I don't know. I don't make eye contact. I hardly speak. You know, my wife's always going like this, talk, they're trying to, you know, make eye contact. That person was trying to make eye contact. It was like... It's not my gift, not my calling. <laughs> Just leave. But talking in front of 2,500 people is easy for me. Uh, 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 you know, a, a mass of humanity is, is a piece of cake for me. I don't mind that at all. But get me one on one, and I am the most nervous awkward person, I don't know what to say. You know, my wife just comes up with the most random, I'm, and I sit there and go, how did she even think to even bring that up? You know, and I'm just sitting there going, that's why she's with me, you're right. And, and people can sense that too, because I know for me, like if we're at the, at the uh, uh, let's say the grocery store, people will look around me to talk to her, and I'm like, <laughs> And by the time we finish checking out, she knows their medications, she knows their family history, their children's name, their grandparents' name, you name it. And me, I'm like, they don't even know my name, you know, I'm just kind of like. <laughs> but those are, you know, different gifts, like I said. But most people who were to meet me in that environment would be go, there is no way you speak in public. There's no way you even speak or go in the public. You're just one of those weird people but God has appointed it you know and it's it's a beautiful thing it really is you know when we're using those gifts when we're using them for his glory and then as he continues on he says are all apostles are all prophets and obviously these are rhetorical questions and the obvious answer is no right are are all apostles are all prophets are all teachers are all workers of miracles do all have the gifts of healings do all speak with tongues do all interpret but earnestly desire the best gifts. You know, I know for me, um, one of the gifts that I've personally have never, God's never given me is the gifts of tongues. I've never spoken in tongues, just never have. But I've heard a lot of people speak in tongues in afterglow services and the interpretations of them, and it's a beautiful thing, but I've never done it. You know, just if I were to try to do it, it would just be some gibberish I was making up like a lot of the ones on TV do, but that's a whole different subject. <laughs> I'm gonna see how many people I can offend today. <laughs> I, can, I, I can check that one off, no. But it, but it says, but earnestly, in the first half of um, verse 31, it says, but earnestly desire the best gifts. What are the best gifts? Are they being apostles? Is the best gift prophets? Is the best gift teachers or the working of miracles? No, you know what the best gifts are? The best gifts are the ones that God has willed for your life. Those are the best gifts. You know, that's what we should be desiring is for God's will in our life, right? Those are the gifts that we should want and that we should, uh, you know, earnestly desire is the gifts that God has gifted us with so that we can use them for his glory and the benefit of the church and his people. Those are the best gifts. And then after all of this, at the end of this chapter, in the second half of verse 31, he says, and yet I show you a more excellent way. He says, you know what? We've, we've had all of these gifts that we've explained. We've talked about the working of miracles, you know, that you have enough faith to remove mountains. Now that sounds like a pretty cool gift, right? You know, or, or the gifts of of healings, being able to heal someone, or speaking in tongues, all these gifts sound great. But he says, and yet, I show you a more excellent way. And that, and yet, I show you a more excellent way is, um, you know, a transition into what uh, chapter 13 is, and that's love. Love is a more excellent way, right? It doesn't matter. All of these things that we say and do don't mean a hill of beans if we're, like we said earlier, if they're not done in love. And so the first three verses in chapter 13 says, though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding 
um, brass are a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. You know, not only does it profit you nothing if it's done without love, it, it, it doesn't profit the body of Christ either. You know, all of these self-sacrificial things it's talking about here, about bestowing all of your goods to feed the poor, in and of itself, that is great, right? You know, we need to do that. But if it's done um, with the wrong attitude, if you're doing it to be seen or to be recognized or to get accolades, then it means nothing. Yeah, the, four, the, the poor still get fed, but um, God isn't glorified in your life through that, is it? Because you're doing it for the wrong reasons. You know the person, it's like, okay, well, okay, I'm going to wait to feed the poor until there's people. Okay, people are watching. Here you go. Oh, God bless you. Here you go. You know, no, that's not what God wants. It, we should be ministering to the poor regardless of anybody's watching or if anybody uh, happens to see or whatever, because we're not doing it for praise, or at least we shouldn't be. We should be doing it out of love for God and the desire that others come to know Him and experience that same love that we have. That's the whole purpose of it. And, and that's why it keeps saying throughout all of these good deeds, right? Though I speak with tongues of men of an angels, but have not love. You know, I have become a brass or a clanging cymbal, right? Don't be a clanging cymbal. There was a joke there, but I'm going to leave it right yeah. there. <laughs> One of the gifts that God doesn't always give me is the gift of discernment, but I'm going to use it right now. <clears throat> and it continues on, and though I have the gift of prophecy, and I understand all the mercy, uh, all the mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing, you know? I am nothing. I could do all these miraculous things, but if I'm not doing it out of love, I'm nothing. You know, when it profit, not only does it profit you individually, but it doesn't profit the church either. So all that we say and do needs to be done out of love, and we, it needs to be done as we've talked about, oh, it's probably been a, a month or so ago, in 1 Corinthians 10.31, where it says, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. You know, it's, it's for God to get glory because He's the only one worthy of that glory. If we're doing it to glorify ourselves or to show our good deeds, then we're doing it with the wrong heart and don't do it, you know. But let's make sure we have the right heart there. You know, and um, like I said, let's earnestly earnestly desire the best gifts, those gifts that God's given us. Let's earnestly desire, uh, you know, to everything that we say and do, not only to give glory to God, but also that we can share the love of God with a dead and dying world. Amen? So as we're going to kind of finish up there with um, the gifts. And like I said, Pastor Aaron next week will, will continue on in the gifts. But what I wanted to talk to you about now is, um, you know, it's been about 10 months since the church's transition to me being the senior pastor. And as part of that, it's time to kind of, um, you know, as, as the spiritual leadership, as we've met and we've prayed and we've talked about um, where this church is going in the future, where we feel like God is leading us. I just kind of wanted to spend a few minutes to kind of cast the vision that, that the leadership has here, that God's kind of given us. Um, but as we do that, I want to take a step back and, and kind of um, give a state of the union sort of, of of where the church is. You know, when we when I first became the senior pastor, because transitions are hard. And, you know, the one thing that uh, if you look at uh, church health studies um, that affects um, the health of the church is lack of, of um, stability behind the pulpit. 
And I know I've been here five, I've been here almost five years, and I'm the third senior pastor. You know, just, I came in a period of time where one was retiring, and then Troy came, and then me, right? And so, know that, with that, we gave, um, as I took over, um, we gave a kind of a where we were at the time and what we needed to do to get through the transition period. And one of the first things we talked about is, is that we as a church, we were going to stand firm. We weren't going to lose ground because of the transition that we were going through. And we used Exodus chapter 14, verses 13 and 14, where it says, And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. So the first thing that we said that we were going to do is we were going to stand still and take a breath, right? We were going to stand still and we were going to watch the salvation of the Lord because um, what we were going to do is we were going to trust God. We were going to trust God that um, if this is his church, we were going to watch his salvation. We were going to watch what he was going to do with this church. You know, and we, as it says in verse 14, the Lord will fight for you. You shall hold your peace. So we held still, didn't we? And we allowed the Lord uh, to fight for us. And then through this 10-month period of time, we've kind of practiced that, haven't we? One of the verses that have, has came up over and over again that we've talked about is Psalm 46.10, where it says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted amongst the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And, you know, so once again, we were still because we know that he is God and we just trusted him for guidance and for direction. Uh, you know, it was important to us that we understood that um, we weren't going to allow a transition, um, you know, to really affect what we did here. We were going to just not fear. We were going to hold strong and not lose our nerve. Uh, but as Second Timothy 1 7 says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. So we weren't going to fear. We were just going to trust him and wait on him to really tell us when we were going to move, when we were going to uh, move on. So we stood still. We took a collective breath. We waited to hear from God, didn't we? And then the next thing that we talked about uh, back during that transition is we were going to move on. And as part of that, we used verse 15 where it says, um, reading those verses, it says, Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again uh, no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold on and hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. And that was the second part of it. We stood still waiting on the Lord's uh, salvation. And now, as it says here, we're going to go forward. We moved on. And in that moving on, we started doing moving forward with outreach, didn't we? We started reaching the community. We started fellowshipping with all the dinners. We started um, moving forward the best we could. And then the last part of it, uh, the third point that we talked about uh, during the transition was we were going to press on and into the Lord and the work that he had for us. And so Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14 say, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, not that I've already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay a hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid a hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press forward, press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You know, this is our Christian walk, isn't it? You know what? Forgetting those things in the past. 
Whatever's happened in the past is in the past. Let's leave it there. Let's not keep dredging it forward. We're going to keep our eyes pointed forward. We're going to keep reaching forward to the things which are ahead. Because the moment that a church starts looking back, you know, or talking about or um, remembering the things of the past, of what God accomplished in the past, and they're not talking about the things that God's currently doing or that he's going to do, then the church is um, dying, isn't it? You know, when you're more glorifying the things in the past that God once did and not focusing on what he's doing and what he's going to do, then, you know, the, the church is starting to slip. And we're not going to allow that to happen, are we? We're going to press forward. We're going to move on. We're going to keep our eyes focused on Jesus and moving forward. Because I don't know, you know, it's, it's really hard to move forward if you're looking back you'll run into a pole or something, won't you? Or at least I will. And so that's what we talked about 10 months ago that we were going to do. And now we're at that point where it's time to really move forward and press in on what God, uh, you know, has really the vision that God has given us here as the leadership and you as the church. And what that looks like as far as the church vision goes is simply this. We have three different aspects of it. It's outreach, inreach, and upreach. And so what do I mean by those, uh, outreach, inreach, and upreach? You know, if you would, you can turn in your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 2. And it's kind of the model um, of the early church that we're using for uh, where we're going as a church. And in Acts chapter 2, we'll begin by looking at verse uh, 40 and 41. And in verse 40 and 41, and it says, and, and with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. You know, I... I when I read these verses, I was really stuck or, uh, with the fact that uh, our text here in Acts, you know, although it numbers the attendance of the people that were saved that day, it wasn't the goal, was it? It wasn't the goal of what was going on. It said, in many other words, he testified, speaking of Peter, and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. You know, calling those people out of the perverse generation that they lived in at that time. I don't know about you, but that would probably be a pretty accurate description of the generation that we live in. The times that we live in is a perverse generation. And so with that, you know, as they receive that, you know, um, is it our job to add to the church? No. It's our job just to love on people. It's our job to present the gospel in an understandable and relevant way, isn't it? That's our job. But then it's up to God, as it says in verse 47, uh, you know, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. You know, that's the whole point of outreach, isn't it? Is that we present the gospel in a way that the, the Lord uses it to add to the church daily. You know, it's not about numbers at our church or uh, whatever. It's about people being saved. It's the cost of souls, isn't it? And the cost of, of reaching lost souls isn't cheap. It isn't cheap with time. It isn't cheap financially. But you know what? I know that's what God's called us to do. And that's why we're going to continue to do it. You know, it's, um, that's the thing about it, too, is the outreach brings them in the doors. But then what do we do with them? Let's say someone gets saved. They get baptized, as it talks about here. That's just the beginning, isn't it? The moment that the outreach brings someone to a relationship with Christ, that's where our responsibility really begins. And that's the inreach part of it. You know, and we see the, and we see that as a, you know, they continued in verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. You know, it, and they continued steadfastly. Nobody was resting on their laurels, were they? You know, after the outreach and people were evangelized, uh, they were brought into the church, right? 
Uh, no one was resting on their laurels. Everybody was using their gifts that they were talking about so that they could reach into the lives of those who were, uh, you know, being saved, that God was bringing. And we talk about here, there's really fourfold responsibility of the church and of us as individuals and what we are going to do. The first one, the apostles' doctrine, right? They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That is the teaching. You know, I think we've done, as a church, I think we've done a great job with outreach. I think we've, you know, we do a very good job of reaching the children, the youth, um, you know, adults. The one area that I'd have to admit and that we're working on doing a better job is um, evangelize or outreaching to uh, the older generation, the seniors. And we have some ideas on how we're going to do that. And when we come back from vacation, we'll talk about that more. But part of the inreach process that, that Apostles Doctrine that we're looking at or that we're developing ways so that we can reach within, like I said, so that we can equip, so that we can outreach, right? Um, we have a really a whole curriculum that's being developed that's going to be instituted beginning in February. And there's, a, I don't know how well that shows on the screen. I guess it shows pretty good. But um, beginning in, in February, we're going to be offering, whoops, um, we're going to be offering blank screens. Uh, but no, we're going to be offering some of these top classes here beginning in February. Some of these other classes are being developed, but what really what we're looking to do is we're developing a continuum over the next probably two to three years where all of these classes will be um, developed and, and offered here at the church. But really what we want to have is a continuum uh, so that from the moment that person gets saved, they can see a path for growth. They can see a path of, of really and a way for us to guide them through some of these classes here. And so we're working on, on getting that together. Some of the classes have already been developed, so that'll be coming soon. Uh, so please be praying about that. And they'll be offered. We'll, let you, we'll give you more information once we have it. But uh, we're really excited about this. This is something we've probably been working on for well over a year. So uh, it's, it's finally coming to fruition. And like I said, in February, it'll probably start being offered some of these classes. And one of the other things that we're doing as far as, um, you know, really making sure that we as a church that we're reaching into and, um, you know, that we're really pressing into the apostles doctrine and the learning and the equipping of the saints is we're changing Wednesday's structure a little bit, just in the sense that we are still going to have the dinner and the fellowship, which is very important. But what we're going to do is we're going to change Wednesdays. We're, we're finishing up with the first book of Psalms. You know, as we've talked about before, there's five books in Psalms. And we'll finish the first one by the time I come back. So when I come back, we, what we're going to do is we're going to um, start teaching verse by verse. And we'll begin in Genesis and go through the Old Testament. So on Wednesdays, we'll be teaching through the Old Testament. And on Sundays, we'll be continuing on through the end of the New Testament, and then we'll wrap back around to Matthew and continue on. So Sunday mornings will be New Testament, Wednesday nights will be uh, Old Testament. So those are some of the ways that we as a church are going to be reaching in, um, you know, and providing that opportunity um, to really grow in, in doctrine. So once we get it in, then we can give it back out with the outreach, right? Equipping, equipping the saints. And the second part of this uh, verse 42 here says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. You know, this, the fellowship part of it, I think we do a pretty good job with, right? We have opportunities to fellowship. We have the dinners. We have the various things that are, are going on through the church, and we're looking to even um, do more. We're going to be pushing home groups and uh, you know, trying to get people in that smaller, more intimate group also. And we're going to continue to do things. Like I said, I'm, I'm working with 
um, the movie theater about renting the auditorium to watch Jesus Revolution. You know, they're, they're, they're still looking into the contract of that, but we're hoping to do those kind of things, just where we can go and, and uh, you know, grow as a family together and, and um, just have that time of, of sweet shell, uh, uh, if I could say the word, fellowship together, right? You know, as it's, it's really the, you know, kind of that spiritual nature of it, isn't it, that, that happens when we corporately get together and we meet and we have that time of, of fellowship. You know, non-Christians, right, those who are outside of the body, they can share in the food and, and they can share in, um, and care for one another type of thing. But as Christians, we have that common bond in Christ that should be celebrated in that fellowship, right? It's that one thing that makes us, our gatherings unique from any other gathering, isn't it? You know, we have that commonality of the cross and of Christ, and we're going to continue doing that. You know, we have that opportunity to share our joys, to share our, our grief together, to esteem each other over ourselves. You know, those things that, that love of God that separates us from, like I said, a, a gathering of just outside of the church. So we're going to continue to promote and we're going to continue to make sure that we're fellowshipping with one another because let's face it, we're family. We're going to spend eternity together. We might as well get used to each other. You can choose your friends, but you're stuck with your relatives. <laughs> yes, David. Amen, brother. So the third part that, you know, also obviously it talks about here as a healthy church is the breaking of bread, you know, communion, of course. You know, once again, we're going to continue to do, um, uh, partake communion together and share in the fact and, and celebrate in the fact that of what Jesus did for us on the cross. You know, it's going to stay the central theme of this church, right? There are so many churches in America well, around the world that are becoming caused focus instead of Christ focused, right? You know, it's one thing and it's good to speak up against evil things that are going on in the world, but we need to make sure that we keep our eye on, on Jesus Christ and Him crucified. All of the rest of the stuff, the causes will, will naturally flow out of that, right? But we're not being swayed from Jesus Christ. We're gonna focus just on Him. We're not going to focus on, you know, what's going on in the government. We're not going to focus on any particular thing except Jesus Christ. And that's it. And like I said, then those issues that uh, happen in society that need to be spoken out of will be naturally flow. We'll, we'll have a heart to defend the unborn babies. We'll have the heart to defend all of these issues, right? But, it's, but we're going to stay focused on Jesus and because he's the answer to whatever the issue is. It's just Jesus. You know, it's real simple. Jesus. That's all we need to know. So we're going to continue on in that. And then lastly, the fourth part of this, in prayers. Notice how that is, is plural, in prayers. It doesn't say in prayer. You know, uh, it says in prayers. You know, we need to make sure, and, and one of the areas that, if I'm being honest on, that we as a church could probably do a better job of is prayer. You know, focusing on prayer and having opportunities to pray. Because the, bio, the Bible is very clear that it is a vital part of our relationship with God. It's a vital part of our church life here, isn't it? You know, in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, it says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You know, pray without ceasing. You know, we need to be a church that prays, don't we? we need, because every foundational thing that God accomplishes through the chair, through the chair, through the church begins in prayer. See, when you combine church and prayer, you get chair. But it's true, you know, that we need to be a church that is praying without ceasing. You know, that we are constantly in an attitude of prayer. Does that mean we're all, you know, all the time? I, 
sneak over to your house. Uh, there you should be on your hands and knees praying. No, it just means we're in an attitude of prayer, right? We're constantly, um, you know, giving thanks and everything to God because we realize that any good and perfect gift, anything that God is in control and we should be praying without ceasing to him, right? Um, or as it says in Colossians 4, 2, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. You know, that's what we need to do. And we need to provide more opportunities to be able to do that. Psalm 145, 8 says, The Lord is near to all who call upon Him, to all who call upon Him in truth, right? We need to be calling upon the Lord because, you know, there is a battle for the souls of many people in this community. You know, there's, uh, just go out, go over next to the U-turn thrift store and look at, you know, the people who are hanging out there. Look at, you know, just how much darkness there is in our community. You know, look at the, the statistics on addiction or, um, you know, um, suicide or all of these things. It's crazy. Let alone, you know, looking at how many deaths or how many people die from fentanyl every day. But the one thing that I do know is, as it says in Jeremiah 33, 3, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. You know, um, These are promises from God. And lastly, in James 5, 16, it says, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty... Wait, that's the wrong verse. <laughs> My cut and paste didn't work there. There's always got to be one slide I mess up on, or it just wouldn't be me. But let's try reading the right verse here. And it says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of, of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half. Three years and six months, and he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. You know, it's saying, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another. We should be praying for one another, shouldn't we? We should be praying for one another, um, you know, all the time, constantly. You know, if we're esteeming each other uh, above ourselves, that's one of the things we should do, and we should be praying for one another. And we're going to be providing more opportunities to do that. And the last part of it is the uh, upreach, you know. Um, and what do I mean by upreach? Really what I'm saying there, um, so we do outreach. We do the inreach, and we talked about the four different ways. And, and finally, most importantly as a church, we've been called to upreach, to reach up to God, right? To give glory to God, to glorify Him, to worship Him. As it says back in Acts chapter 2, verse 47, praising God and having favor with all people, right? If we don't have favor with all people, if they don't see something different about us, then they're not going to want to hear what we have to say, right? If we're not a loving church, if we're not a church that demonstrates love, then they don't want to hear what uh, we have to say. They can be, they can be talked to, talked down to or whatever without coming to church, right? It's like, why do I got to get dressed up on a Sunday morning to go, uh, be around a bunch of people that's going to act like anywhere else. No, you know, um, praising God and having favor with all, uh, with all people. That's what we strive to do as a church, isn't it? It's to give God the praise and to have favor with the people so that, because the moment that we have praise with the people, it gives us an open invitation to share the good news of God's, uh, you know, of what God's did in our life and what he's doing in this church, right? When we devote ourselves as a church and as we devote ourselves as a church, because that's what we're going to do, that's what we're focused on, you know, through the teaching of God's word, you know, he's glorified. For on every page of the New Testament, um, you know, and throughout the Bible, 
We see Christ as exalted and God is praised, right? That's what we should be doing. When we come together in that, in that fellowship, in that caring fellowship, preferring the needs of each other to our own, you know, when we're giving back in our time and our, our talents and our treasures back to the church, when we're esteeming that over, you know, what, what God has called us to do, we're giving God glory, aren't we? You know, we're praising God through our life and through our actions. And when we're breaking bread and celebrating communion, you know, when we as a family are doing these things and we're raising our, our voices and praise to God and in corporate prayer, certainly God is praised in that, isn't he? God is glorified in that. And so, you know, as a church, this is the opportunity for us as we have this vision and as we're moving forward and as we're going to continue to reach out to the lost and we're going to continue to uh, in reach to the saved and we're all going to upreach to God and give him the glory he deserves. You know, that's what we're going to do. You know, that it's not a bunch of platitudes and, and you know, taglines for what, uh, you know, as a church or marketing gimmicks. No, these are just biblical ideas that, that we as a church should be practicing anyways. But it just, those are the areas that we're gonna be focusing on, outreach, inreach, and upreach. And, uh, you know, with that, let's upreach and uh, lift the, the Lord up now. If the worship team could come up for the final worship song, and as we do, <coughs> Uh, let's go before the Lord in prayer one more time. <clears throat> Lord, we come before you, and God, we are so grateful for your word. God, we're so grateful, uh, you know, just for all of those here in this church that are using the giftings you've given them, God, for your glory. Lord, I pray as a church that you would help us to have that desire to reach the lost, Lord. And also to edify each other, Lord, to build up, to equip each other. And Lord, ultimately, all of this is done. All of the giving, all of the uh, time spent, all of the outreaches that we do is so that we can glorify you, Lord. So God, we just love you and praise you. Lord, we're so grateful for all that you're doing in and through this church and all that you are going to do in the future. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. If you all would stand with us as we sing this last song to our Father.
this love so undeniable I I can hardly speak peace so unexplainable I I can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call me Don't forget there's pastors up here if you need prayer. Don't leave uh, this morning without getting prayed for. God bless. Thank you for coming this morning.